First Kings chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22. This is a weighty subject for disciples only. We're going to talk about that cross that they spoke of. An aspect that uh, really mature believers will experience to some degree. Uh, and that's primarily what we're going to deal with today is, is the cross that mature believers are, must be willing to bear. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. And it goes right along with what we've been talking about. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 1. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. Now, if you go back to chapter 20, uh, there was a prophet in verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. And then said he, said he unto him, Behold, uh, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And, it's, and the man smote him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way. He's waiting for Ahab and disguised himself with, with ashes or some sort of bandage on his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king. And he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, uh, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, Sure, so shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went uh, to his house heavy and displeased. Now, according to Josephus, that prophet was Messiah, who we're going to talk about today. We don't know for sure, but that was the Jewish historian. He said that was Micaiah, and because of that incident, he was put in prison. Three years later, Ahab's still alive. Seemed as though that prophecy wasn't going to do any good. Didn't take effect. Three years later, it's possible that Micaiah was either sitting in prison or kept in some sort of uh, ward to where... When they wanted him in this situation, they knew exactly where he was, and they fetched him quickly. So it's very possible that Josephus had it right. 1 Kings 22 and verse 2. And it came to pass in the third year, three years later, that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that reign with Gilead and his hours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord hath delivered it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord of, of Jehovah besides that we may inquire of him? Jehoshaphat obviously knew these were company men. Yeah. And, I, and uh, he said, No, we, we need a real prophet of the Lord. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he hath not prophesied good concerning me, but evil. Isn't that so much like the attitude of people today? Prophecy had to do with saying, Thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. And yet, he said, I hate this guy because he doesn't prophesy good to me. So what's the problem? It's him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? It's like, why don't you change? Why do you expect God to change for you? No, I hate him. He didn't prophesy good concerning me. As though the prophet determines the message. As though the prophet has a choice of what God's going to say. As though the prophet is controlling God. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah the son of Imlah. 
And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having on their robes, in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. <coughs> and Zedekiah, the son of Canaan, made him horns of iron, and said, Thus saith the Lord, With thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou hast consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the, in the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. <coughs> and Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And I'm going to probably give you uh, a little add in here, just from the obvious sense of the scripture. And he answered him, as he looked at all these other prophets, he answered him and said, go up, prosper, the Lord will deliver it into your hand. Well, it was obviously a mock. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou tell me nothing, but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills, as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did, not, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah the son of Canaanah went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek, and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon the governor of the city, and to Joash the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself, and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And Jehoshaphat must have been a pretty simple fellow. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. <coughs> and it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when, came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore, he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria. And the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord which he spake. I want you to consider the situation here. It is much like what every prophet who has ever spoken in the word, name of the Lord, the word of the Lord, has had to deal with. Here we have the nation of Israel. God's people, right? We have the king uh, of Israel and the king of Judah coming together and working together. After so many years of division, they are working together again in unity. That's got to be good, right? The king is seeking God's direction. 
Jehoshaphat's being a good example here, being a good influence, and, and Ahab and them are seeking God's direction. He is aligned. They are aligned together to go against heathen. They're fighting against idolatrous, uncircumcised heathen people for land that is rightfully Israel's. The prophets all came speaking with one mouth in the name of the Lord. And it was good. Israel's going to prosper. The king is going to conquer. We're going to whoop the Syrians and take back our land. How can that be bad? It's all good, isn't it? God shows Micah the true picture. The coming judgment and death of Ahab. Because it had been prophesied three years before. And it hadn't happened. And, by the way, 1 Kings 20, we read, is where that prophecy was. This is 22. Guess what they did in chapter 21? They took away Naboth's vineyard, lied and set up a righteous man, had him slain uh, on an uh, accusation of blasphemy, and killed him and took his vineyard. That's what they were doing in the meantime. So here, in chapter 20, Ahab is helped by the Lord, but he's not in tune with God, and so he lets Ben-Hadad go. He's rebuked for it. At first, in chapter 21, he's in rebellion to God and takes Naboth's vineyard. In chapter 22, <coughs> he kills oxen and, and sheep in abundance and entices Jehoshaphat to go fight with him. And now he wants God's approval. After all, I've made peace with Jehoshaphat and, and uh, my daughter has married his son. And this is a good thing. We're all together again. God's people. Surely God is happy and God is pleased. Now, Micaiah was an Israelite. He loved his country. He loved his people. He longed to see God's people prosper. <clears throat> He wanted them to fulfill the purposes of God. Did he want his king to lose? Did he want to see Israelites slain? Godly, you know, God's people, the Israelite men, Israelite sons. Did he want to see them slain? Did he want to see more land taken away? Did he want to see Israelite mothers and daughters weeping? Not a hard situation, isn't it? Don't you think that Micaiah wanted to have 400 preacher brothers with him and join in with him and, and be proclaiming a positive message and everybody happy and, and joyful and after all, God's going to get the glory, right? He wanted to cheer his king and his nation. He wanted his people to prosper. He wanted God to bless and protect his homeland. That he knew better. They were on the wrong side of God. Oh, it looked really nice in the eyes of the public. It was politically correct for these two nations to be working together. Do you think Micaiah enjoyed breaking the peace and spoiling the positive atmosphere? Was he just jealous of all the other prophets getting the attention? Did he just want to be different? Did he just not like having friends? He's one of those odd fellows who just didn't like having friends. Did he just think he was right and everybody else was wrong due to pride and self-delusion? Well, I'm sure that that was said, aren't you? Yeah. I'm sure that plenty of that was said. <coughs> I hate him for he never prophesied good concerning me. He's just an odd fellow. He just, he's out of tune with everybody else. Everybody else is saying this and he's got to say that. Mm -hmm. 400 prophets, surely they know better than just this one. Why doesn't he, why doesn't he humble himself and realize that surely these 400 people are all wrong? He needs to just humble himself and fall in line. Would that have been humility? They were on the wrong side of God. But, but, they would not be corrected. They would not be improved. <coughs> What a sad situation. People love to claim children of God's status, yet not submit to God's word. Right. They were in rebellion to their rightful Lord. They were ungrateful wretches. God had done so much for their nation, and yet now they were worshiping golden calves. They had a Baal, the temple of Baal going full time, and uh, they were persecuting the prophets of God. 
They were arrogantly disregarding God's definition of good. Yeah. You notice how many times they spouted good? Mm -hmm. Good. What is good? What is good? Does your good line up with God's good? Oh, they said the prophets are prophesying good. Ahab said, this guy never prophesies good. He said, let your words let your words be like all of them and speak that which is good. What does good mean? They were offending God. God's wrath was about to be poured out. And what Ahab couldn't appreciate is, Micaiah was his opportunity for mercy. Yeah. God sent a lying spirit in all those prophets and how appropriate it was that God showed Micaiah the truth of what was going on here. Had they not called Micaiah, they deserved to be deceived by those prophets. But since they went ahead and called Micaiah, Micaiah shared with them what was going on. It was a test. Those prophets all had a lying spirit and this is what God was doing. And this man whom he hated, this man who uh, seemed so contrary, was their opportunity for mercy. Was their opportunity for repentance. So who's the bad guy? The prophet. Do you ever wonder why prophets weep? Here's a situation. It's a hopeless situation. Micaiah knew they weren't going to listen to him. And yet, he was their only hope. <clears throat> he knew they weren't going to listen to him. He knew all those people were going to believe these Yehu prophets out here. He knew that, that they had their ears because they were saying what the people wanted. And it seemed to make sense. Why wouldn't God bless Israel and Judah getting together and fighting against the Syrians? Then, is that a no-brainer or what? <laughs> yeah. Depends on what you call good. What is good? The happiness of man? The prosperity of a wicked king? <clears throat> Were three and a half years of drought good? God thought so. In their state of rebellion, God deemed it good. Romans 2, 3 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Yeah. That's what's good. Yeah. God wants you to repent. God doesn't care if you prosper. He wants you to repent. Yeah. And if taking your prosperity away, if giving you a drought, if, if causing you problems will lead you to repentance, that's good. Amen. But it's not the good he wanted. It's not the good that Ahab wanted. You know, Saul of Tarsus thought it was good. He says here in his own words in Galatians 1.13, For ye have heard of my conduct in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. <coughs> that was good. He thought he was doing good. Later on, he realizes the state of his nation, that he was one of them. And he says in Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay, so... <clears throat> what, uh, what is good? Paul realized that there was a time when he thought he was doing good. Later on, he looks back and says, no. My good was in opposition to God's good. That's right. <laughs> My idea of good was actually militating against God's idea of good. Consider Jehoshaphat. He loved God. He loved... Uh, you know, he, he did a lot of good things in... in, in uh, Judah, but he loved man's praise. He sympathized with man's desires. He was compromised by his idea of good. 
He had it all figured out in his mind what he thought was good, good enough, good for him, good for his situation, good in his uh, arrangement there, but he was compromised by it. <coughs> in 2 Chronicles 19.2, after this little episode here that we just read about, Jehoshaphat's coming back home. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore there is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Oh, but it was politi uh, politically correct to do what I did. I mean, our nations are getting together. We're fighting against the Syrians. It seems so right. God has a definition of good. If your definition of good does not line up with His, you're bad. That's right. That's right. And what you want to do is bad. And what you think is right is bad. And what you think is appropriate is bad. Because there's somebody who made the planet. Yeah. And there's someone who made the air. The one who owns the planet and the universe, He's the one who gets to define good. That's right. <clears throat> Who is the proper example of God's love? The prophets who were saying what was good for Israel and good for Ahab? The ones who were, who were speaking positive and assuring? Or Micaiah who came out and spoiled it all and made everybody hate him? Micaiah who gave this negative message of judgment? Who is the proper example of God's love? You know, Jehoshaphat, through this foolishness, lost his son. Well, I didn't know that would happen, but God did. God did. He brought ruin and destruction to his own nation. Well, he couldn't foresee that, but God could. Well, he truly couldn't see it coming that this was actually a plan of Satan to destroy the seed of David, and he almost succeeded. Yeah. At one time, the promises of God based on the seed of David hung by the life of a little infant, Joash. Yeah. Athaliah is on the throne. This is the seed of David, the only one left. She destroyed all the rest. This one was hidden away. And God's promises all hang on this thin thread. And how did this happen? Because Joash was doing what he thought was good. If people repent of their stubborn promotion of their good and get in tune with God's good, think of how much destruction could be averted. And this is why prophets weep. Because God shows them what's really going on. And everybody is wrapped up in their stubborn promotion of what they think is good. Right. Good enough, what is reasonable, what is balanced, what is appropriate. And they're not listening to God, who has a much better view of the whole subject. From Genesis to Revelation, yes. eternity past, he has a good perspective, a much better view. Have you ever tried to <coughs> make a straight fence? You put a post way out here, and you put a post at this end. Now, I dare you to go in the middle between those posts, <coughs> and it, so I, you know, get it all sided up and set this post. Now I'm in the middle. Someone from the other end looks at it, and you're way off. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for you to line up this post in the middle by trying to line yourself up with those two posts. That's right. It's impossible. <clears throat> Someone standing at the end will say, no, you got to go that way. And you feel like this is totally, I mean, that, that can't be right. I've been there. Your idea, your little perspective of good, what you think is good, what you think is fair, what you think is right, cannot be trusted. That's right. Amen. Listen to Jeremiah. What we're talking about today is... is why prophets weep? Prophets weep because, just like Micaiah, they love their nation. They love their neighbors. They love their fellow man. They love their family. They love their relatives. 
relatives. They love their grandparents. They love their brothers and sisters. They love their cousins. They, wanna, they want everybody to be happy, but they want God to be happy. And they realize if God's going to be happy, these people have to get in line. But those people are convinced that their good is good enough. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and so, guess who, gets, guess who gets to be the bad guy? Jeremiah 13, <clears throat> verse 9. <clears throat> God told Jeremiah to take a girdle of nice linen and go out and bury it by the Nile River or by some river I forget what it was and then after a while go dig it back up again anyways when he dug it back up guess what it was half rotten and uh <clears throat> It would have been the Nile River. He, he, Euphrates. Euphrates. Euphrates River, yeah. Um, I was thinking he got carried to Egypt, but he wasn't in Egypt yet. When he went and dug this girl back up, it wasn't worth much. And God said, listen, verse 9, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah, and the great pride of Jerusalem, this evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their own heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. But they would not hear. And I will dash them one against another, even the fathers and the sons together, saith the Lord, I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but destroy them. Now listen to Jeremiah's response. He, he, in, in response to this, he speaks to the people. Hear ye and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. <coughs> How unnecessary. So unnecessary. But these people were convinced. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute why and what happened. And it's something that any of us can fall into. Okay? Let's continue reading. Say unto the king and to the queen, Humble yourself, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it, and it shall be wholly carried away captive. <laughs> Lift up your eyes, and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains and as chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? And if thou say in thine heart, Wherefore come these things upon me? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels made bare. Now listen, listen to this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Therefore will I scatter them as a stubble that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. This is thy lot. The portion of thy measure for me, said the Lord, because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. You have redefined good as to what you wanted it to be, and you're determined to maintain that definition. Now, how that happen? The Calvinists use this, but they don't know what they're talking about. This is not talking about inability. This is talking about where you get when you become accustomed yes. to something. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to doing. Nothing about predestination here. Then may ye do good that are accustomed to do evil. You'll find it. You'll find <clears throat> These people could not be convinced that they were under God's wrath because they thought they were good. Yep. Now, there was a good, there was a mind frame that they had become accustomed to. 
And because they had become accustomed to it, they thought it must be good enough. And in order for them to change, they had to change what they were accustomed to. Right. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, and I did this, this last week I've been thinking about this. What have I become accustomed to? Mm. You know, you can be, become accustomed to being clean or dirty. I know someone, and if you go... They, you go in their house, and my experience was that there was a little path, and everything was stacked to the ceiling on both sides, and as that path turned, I could get over to where the breaker panel was in the basement, and the water heater. And then a, the path continued to the stairs, it went upstairs, and the basement was plumb full. You know what that person, uh, when I went upstairs, it was the same way. You know how they solved the problem? They bought a new house and moved. Um, that the old houses, they've got four or five houses in Brookfield that are plumb full and there's just barely paths from door to door. And when they get too full, they buy another house and move. They're accustomed to that. It doesn't bother you. I couldn't handle it, but they're accustomed to it. I did a job for someone. I walked in their house and the smell about knocked me down. The German shepherd that lived there was named Thor. And a house smelled like Thor. Mm -hmm. Everything in that house. I think I smelled like Thor once I walked out of there. <clears throat> you think it bothered the person living there? They were accustomed to it. I was not accustomed to it. <clears throat> I was going to tease Brother Jeremy today, but he didn't make it. He, Hopefully he's listening online. What would it take for Brother Jeremy to speak without his accent? <laughs> I was teasing him that uh, Brother Jeff here is going down to Tennessee maybe to sell some, some cups with Civil War things. And, and he's taking Brother Jeremy to interpret for him. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, once you get an accent... You're raised in a certain part of the country and you have an accent. What does it take to change that? Kind of like the leper changing his spots. You're accustomed to it. You know, you can become accustomed to godly habits or ungodly habits. That's right. Good character or poor character. Think about your manners, your speech, your self-discipline or the lack, your level of pride or humility. What have you become accustomed to? Whatever you become accustomed to, it becomes very hard to change. Yes. Partly because you have accepted it as included in the realm of good. Mm -hmm. It's good enough. Your level of modesty, your level, I mean, uh, there's some people who uh, don't seem to have a lot of discretion in talking too much. But they become accustomed to it. There's other people who need to be more friendly. They're, 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 they're uh, semi-rude, you know. They, they, like, they need to, the heathen would have friends but show himself friendly. But there are, there are ranges. You can be too friendly, you can be not friendly enough. But they become accustomed to it, yep. and they think it's fine. <clears throat> These people in Israel, they think they know where okay is. But the question is, is my evaluation of okay... Is that, is that the same as God's evaluation of okay? This is okay. What if God said it's not okay? Then what? Well, we're in big trouble then. That's right. These people sought to be balanced. You know, this prophet is extreme. We want to be balanced. We're in the middle of the road. Where we want to be average. Well, what is average? Average is the middle point between the worst and the best. Does God want you average? Does He want you to be an average Christian? Halfway between the best and the worst. Halfway between the most obedient and the most disobedient. Mm. But that's, that's where they think it is reasonable. Reasonable religion. Reasonable devotion. Reasonable holiness. These, this prophet, he's unbalanced. He's abnormal. 
And after all, these people who thought they were normal, did they not have the majority view? Uh -huh. If they took a vote on it, would not everybody vote that they were normal and Micaiah was abnormal? That the, the, the Jews were normal and Jeremiah, he was extreme. He was abnormal. Well, it depends on whether you're voting in heaven or on earth, right? That's right. right. Yeah. <clears throat> heaven would have a different vote, wouldn't they? The prophet was getting his perspective from God's word, God's law. Thus saith the Lord. He saw God's definition of good. <coughs> he saw what they called good. He saw what they said was balanced and what God said was balanced. What they said was okay versus what God said was okay. And he realized this is bad. This is real bad. But because they were accustomed to it, it was like Ethiopian changing his skin or the leper changing his spots. It's not going to happen. Are you accustomed to half obedience? You say, well, my parents put up with it. But are they pleased? Does it please them? Well, you know, I had to get a spanking. Is God pleased? Oh, I think it's good enough. <laughs> what about disrespect? Disrespecting your elders. Disrespecting your parents, your grandparents. Disrespecting other people's possessions, properties, like we talked about in Sunday school. Oh, well, I got by with it. I, didn't, I just got rebuked. But is it righteous? I think it's okay. Oh, what does God think? I think it's, in, I think it's within the realms of acceptable. Uh, what does God think? What about uh, being ornery? Mischievous? What about exaggeration and dishonesty? What about a sassy mouth? Oh, it's become a habit. It's part of my demeanor. <coughs> I mean like a leopard spots? Mm. I'm accustomed to it. Mm. Maybe everybody around you is accustomed to it. But God doesn't get accustomed to anything but His definition of good. Amen. God does not, God will not grow accustomed to your compromise of righteousness. That's right. <clears throat> what about unkindness? Being mean. Being unloving. You know, that could send you to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 22, if you're angry with your brother without cause. Without a sufficient cause. It's not righteous. It's not just. You're just being mean. Mm -hmm. You're just being unloving. You're just being unkind. Jesus said that could send you to hell. And it will. Right. What about laziness? Shirking your duty. Walking by and saying somebody else can take care of it. Oh, there's, there's something that needs to be done. Uh, I'll just slip over here and act busy. Let somebody else do it. I'm not going to do it unless I'm told. Mom and Dad didn't tell me to do it. The preacher didn't tell me I had to. Do you realize God's definition of good includes continual improvement? Yes. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's good. From wherever you're at. Oh, yeah, but, but I think I've done that. No, you haven't. You're not done. No. You're not finished. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Not coasting. So are you seeking approval or improvement? Are you seeking to improve? You know, it's amazing to me. That if I want someone to improve, I'm going to have chapter, verse, and command of God. But for them to do what they're accustomed to, everybody's just expected that, you know, who could question that? Right. So what if we're accustomed to it? You know, we in America here, just because of our environment, we might be accustomed to some things that God doesn't think is good. We might be accustomed to speaking. You know, young people in Job's time... The last guy that spoke, Elihu, was quiet because those who were older were speaking. Uh 
Huh. You know, there's manners, there's there's appropriateness where young people know where their place is. Like Jesus said in the in the sitting in the highest seat or the lowest seat, when you realize I am younger, I'm gonna wait and not speak out right now because I'm younger. I'm gonna let the uh, let age speak first, and then maybe I'll speak in it when it's more appropriate. You know, knowing my place, humbling myself, not being uh, not being forthright. And spouting my opinion on something that uh, I really don't know, I haven't studied, maybe there's others here who should speak and not me. What about being accustomed to biases? Mm -hmm. well, I'm from the South. Well, I'm from the North. So we're biased about our opinion on the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe you need to drop that. Amen. <clears throat> but we're accustomed to it. That's dangerous. You know, if there's anything in your life, you ought to stop and do a self-evaluation. And if there's something there that is only there by, by reason of you being accustomed to it, and there's no godly purpose, it's not edifying, it doesn't glorify God, it's not, glorify, it's not building the kingdom, it's just because this is part of me because I'm accustomed to it. That's what happened to Israel. They were still giving sacrifices. <coughs> you read Isaiah chapter 1. To what intent? To what end is all your new moons and your sacrifices? They were doing all that. They were listening to their prophets. Their prophets that agreed with their concept of good. The prophets that agreed with their concept of okay. They're the ones who got their ear. But they weren't totally irreligious. They weren't totally heathen. They were circumcised children of Abraham. They just had a different good than God did. And they had so become accustomed to it that they could not give it up. And then God gave up on them. Listen to the prayer of Jeremiah in 14.7. O oh Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in time of trouble. Why shouldst thou be a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for the night? Why shouldst thou be as a man of stone eat, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O oh Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Now listen to what the Lord says. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. <coughs> the people are fasting and praying, right? When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Now listen. You wonder why prophets weep? Listen. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you a sure peace in this place. God, the prophets are telling them that they're okay. The prophets are telling them that their good is lined up with your good. God said no. It's not. It's not, and I'm tired of it. They've become so accustomed to their definition, their way. They've chosen out the prophets they wanted to listen to. And I'm sick of it, and it's over. I gave up on them. Don't pray for them anymore. And Jeremiah's like, oh, this is so hopeless. <clears throat> this is such a hopeless situation. Just like Micaiah. He's torn by the love for the people, his love for God, his knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> this has been repeated in history so many times. Yeah. Number one, we have a loving, righteous, worthy God who is responsible for establishing law and order in His creation. He has, from the beginning, only sought the blessing and prosperity of His people. Jeremiah 7, 23. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. 
But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. They were so stuck with what they were accustomed to, they could not be corrected. They could not be improved. They could not grow. They could not change. Let me ask you this morning. Where are you seeking improvement in your life? Where are you seeking to improve your Christian testimony? Where are you seeking to improve your relationship to God? Where are you seeking to improve your knowledge of the Word of God? Oh, well, Brother Mark, I, I, did, I don't know that I really was at the moment. Well, then you're telling God something else, aren't you? You're telling Him that you are, you are pleased with what you're accustomed to. That's scary. Beware becoming accustomed to something that is good enough for you. Beware. Number two, we have a nation of people who have convinced themselves that they are worthy of God's blessing and are actually being blessed. Go up and prosper. God will deliver it into your hands. I mean, it looks like blessing all 400 prophets all say the same thing. The king's coming together. We're going against the Assyrians. If God's not in it, I don't know what he's in. I had somebody told me that about Amway. Boy, if God's not in this, I don't know where God is. I'm like, yeah, you don't. <clears throat> Jeremiah 7 9. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? No, they wouldn't say that, but that's what they did. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the people today, they wouldn't come out and say that, but that's the way they live. Right. I'm, I'm you know, I'm delivered. <coughs> oh, I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm, I'm saved. Jesus paid it all. While I go and think I'm delivered to commit adultery and, and walk after other uh, ungodliness. Jeremiah 8.8 8. How do ye say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it, and the pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken low. They have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? The plight of the prophet. This nation was prospering. They see no wrong in seeking their own fulfillment. And Baal fit the model perfectly. Baal was the god of fertility, prosperity, fruitfulness. Yeah, this is this is great. We've redefined God. They didn't they didn't necessarily think that they were serving a false god. They thought they they thought that they had properly defined God after all. They had the right definition of God. Our God, my my God is a God of love. You ever heard that? Well, my God is loving. My God forgives everybody. My God's compassionate. Well, yeah. Baal will be whatever you want him to be. That's right. Number three, we have false prophets and priests who unanimously speak peace and safety and blessings to the people. Do you realize that Ahab's prophets had heard from a spirit? They were not. 400 men had heard from a spirit. Do you realize that? This was not just something they conjured up. They knew in their hearts we have heard from a spirit. They assumed it was God's spirit. And for Micaiah to come out and say, no, it was a lying spirit from the Lord. It's like, well, who are you? Jeremiah 8.11 For they have healed the herd of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 11. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness, 
they shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Okay, realize these people thought they were good. God said, you're like Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, not us. Listen, our, our, preachers, our preachers are telling us something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. You know... I have seen so much profaneness from the pulpit in Baptist churches and Baptist circles. The cockiness, the jokes, the, the arrogance. And you know what? I would, in going to Bible college in two different places, that profaneness spread through all the preacher boys. And those preacher boys went out and spread it through all the nation. Sad. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord has said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard His word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? <clears throat> Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. The people in Jesus' day who were wanting to crucify him could look back and criticize those people who didn't listen to Jeremiah and Isaiah. And that's why Jesus said, you're the, you're the children of the ones who slew the prophets, and you're going to fill up you're going to fill up the measure as you slay the very Son of God. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Now listen to this. Here's some criteria for discerning. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Down in verse 30 it says, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. You better be careful doing that. Amen. There's people I know. Oh, God said this and God told me that. He did not. Amen. Not unless you can look at. Not unless you can show me in the Bible. That's Don't right. tell me God's been whispering in your ear. Just because you felt like maybe you should do this because of truth that God illuminated you to. Don't tell me God told me. Amen. Okay, you be careful doing that. That's dangerous. <clears throat> they use their tongues and say, "He saith, Behold, I am against them that prophesy." false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So we have the kings, we have the nation, we have the false prophets, and then we have the true prophet. Pity the man. And yet, he's the only one who's got an eternity. You know, I loved it when I was reading where Jesus said, And many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all the prophets in the kingdom of heaven. And I thought, huh? they made it! Yeah. They all made it! Jesus said, you're going to sit down with all the prophets. Not the false prophets, obviously. The true prophets. Mm -hmm. These men, these men who bore the cross,
You look out over the nation, our nation, you look out over the churches, you look out over Christendom, and it's the same view these men had. God is not being honored. That which is being spoken in His name is not true and right. They're not causing people to turn from their evil ways and their sin, and yet they're promising the blessing of God. God is with you. God is forgiving you. Jesus loves you. And God's saying, I didn't send those men. And they're causing my people to err by their lies. Oh, if God wants to tell me something different, He knows my address. God isn't going to come to you personally. Nope. God has spoken through His Word. He's spoken through His preachers. That's right. And if you're not willing to receive it from there, and if you're not discerning and caring enough to realize these preachers are not in line with the Word, but these preachers are, therefore I'm going to go over here, then you're going to reap the fruit of deception. That's right. Isaiah 30, verse 9. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, the prophets, see not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. It's amazing to me that when people sit back and think about following the Lord, I mean really following the Lord, like moving to a biblical church, I mean like actually getting their life cleaned up, they stop and decide whether I'm going to like this or not. Well, you haven't, you haven't changed then, have you? That's right. Do I think this is going to be good for me? Isaiah 42, 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith restore. Who among you will give ear to this? They didn't think it was true. They didn't think they were in prison houses. They didn't think they were robbed and spoiled. He goes on to say, Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? <clears throat> Who gave Jacob for a spoil in Israel to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient to his law. Christendom today thinks the word law is a bad word. Yeah. If I were to say I'm preaching the law of God, they would think I was a heretic. Mm -hmm. They think that law and grace are militating against each other. And if you got law, you don't have grace. And if you have grace, you don't have... They don't know what they're talking about. They're lost in the woods. They're speaking. They're strengthening the hands of evildoers by promising them life. That's right. Did you ever wonder why prophets weep? Every one of God's messengers wanted to proclaim a positive blessing. They wanted people to be happy and they wanted God to be happy. They wanted the people to prosper and they wanted God to be glorified. I would love if all of my relatives were in this room this morning, all submitted to the things of God, all understanding the Bible properly, on the narrow road, headed for heaven. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. That's why prophets weep. <laughs> The plight of the prophet is our plight if we take There's up no the way to avoid this heartbreaking, heart-wrenching, frustrating situation if you're going to take up the cross. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Not because he enjoyed that. Not because he was one of those weird fellows who just likes being sad and whoa, whoa, whoa with everybody. No. That's not the reason. Luke 13, 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, until the time when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Until your heart is so changed to where when the prophet of God comes, you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
until that's your attitude. When the preacher preaches, you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. When the word of God is given to you, you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Until that's your heart, you won't see God. Luke 19. Same gospel. Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You knew not when God told you what was good that you needed to change from what you were accustomed to. The good you were accustomed to had to go in the trash. And you needed to accept the good that God delivered. You understand that? That's the problem. That's where the battle is. Defining good. Man's will versus God's will. Man's values versus God's values. You got man's feelings versus God's feelings. A good that sympathizes with man or a good that sympathizes with God. Man's definition of godliness or God's definition of godliness. Expecting man to submit or expecting God to compromise. Man's definition of love versus God's definition of love. Man's methods of evangelism versus God's methods of evangelism. Man's motives for religion versus God's will for religion. The true prophet can't help but weep because he is torn. He loves his country. He loves his relatives. Do you want God giving up on your relatives? Do you want God giving up on your country? What if God told you it was definitely coming soon? That God was going to give up? That's what, that's what these men saw. Right. God gave up on Ahab. God was giving up on Israel. God, the, the Lord's flock, the children of Abraham, who had come through the, the Red Sea, and all this, the, they were going to be carried away captive and enslaved by heathen idolaters. But they would not hear you want God giving up? What can the prophet do? All he can do is proclaim the righteous judgment of God. Yeah. Warn the wicked to turn and weep. Second Timothy 4.1 Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, what they're accustomed to, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Because that's what they were accustomed to. Their definition of good was good enough. Good enough. John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep your saying. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, this is the meat. This is the cross. This is the sorrow of the mature believer. Will you take it and carry it? Will you stand faithful to God's Word in a hopeless situation? A hopeless situation where you're viewed as the problem. You're viewed as the enemy. And yet, you're, you know that you are actually their opportunity for mercy. You're their chance for blessing. You're their opportunity for truth and light. 
but you're being evaluated by those who are accustomed to something else. You're being evaluated by those who are accustomed to their definition of good and that makes you look like the evil one. Are you willing to speak out? Are you willing to weep? You cannot follow Jesus without joining the weeping of the prophets. Right. Jesus wept. You can't follow Jesus. You can't be in tune with Jesus. You can't truly be a mature disciple, a comrade of the cross. You can't do that if you're not willing to weep where He wept. It's not going to get any better. The situation is not a pretty one. Micaiah thought, man, how hopeless can it get? I, Micaiah could understand why he looked like the bad guy. From their perspective, he understood why. But there were things in the equation that they didn't have in their equation. One of them was God. God's definition of good was not in their equation. They had a different definition of good. Jeremiah, if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. God is calling His children to stand for truth. There's no promise that we're going to be treated any better than them. If Micaiah was in jail for three years from the last proclamation, and now to take him back. What was in it for Micaiah? It wasn't getting better. There was no revival. There weren't a great line of converts. He knew that he was speaking truth and he was willing to die on that basis. Yes. To sit in prison on that basis. No success in sight. You wonder why prophets weep? What a heart-wrenching situation. <clears throat> Let's stand together. <laughs> the first time I preached this message was after a number of families left in 2006. There was many prophets telling them that they were doing the right thing. I knew they were doing the wrong thing. I couldn't convince them. I knew they were headed down a bad road. I knew they were going to make shipwreck. I knew their precious young people were going to become prey to the devil. But I was the bad guy. So every time, every warning, everything I said I only made me look more proud and arrogant because after all, all these other people were saying something else. So for you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. It's like, what if I am? What if you know, what if I am? It didn't, didn't matter. They didn't want me to be right. right. They didn't want me to be true. And we have wept as we've watched the shipwreck after shipwreck after shipwreck. And that's just one incident. How many others that you all who've been here very long at all have seen? And you try to talk to them. You try to reason with them. You plead with them. You rebuke them. You pray for them. You wonder why prophets weep? <clears throat> There's good reason why prophets weep. Any thoughts before we pray? I understand completely what you said about Micaiah. As a, he understood why he looked back. Okay. The, the things that are good in our life. Okay, if you came out of the world and all of a sudden you decide you want to follow God, but maybe you go from the world's music to contemporary Christian or something. And, That's good. You, know, hey, you become right. accustomed to that. You think you're okay. You think it's good because yeah. I'm not doing that anymore. Right. And then if your ears are open and your eyes can see, you might hear or see something that tells you, no, that's not that's not in line with God. And so, oh, well, then I, I need to make some changes. So you go and you make some changes. Well, then 
as a parent, you have these children who become accustomed to what it is that you park at for the longest time. Right. And then suddenly you say, well, no, this isn't it either. Uh, this isn't it. According to the Word of God, this isn't it. Well, that's it was good enough for them. It's what they got accustomed to. So now you're off on some tangent because you're you're going for something even more. We're, we're okay here. This is good. This yeah. is better than it could be. Right. And so then we have our children here. And it's, it's interesting because they, they become accustomed to hearing the truth. Mm. And even our children can pick out ridiculous falsehoods in other preaching or in other doctrines. <clears throat> even, even the ones that haven't made a commitment to follow Christ yet hear that. And so they're becoming accustomed to hearing the truth. Now that's good. Yeah. And I pray that that will continue on. Amen. And, you know, one of the dangers there is if we become accustomed to being hearers, we need to become accustomed to being doers. Amen. And even in my life, little things, you know, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, maybe my creed is perfect. But what about my character? Hmm. What about my attitude? What about my mannerism? There's always room for perfection. That's right. And so, you know, I, I think it's dangerous if we become accustomed. Maybe, okay, maybe the amount of foolishness I allow in my life, I become accustomed to something like that. Maybe, you know, there's so many things, if we stop and analyze in our lives, that may be hindering God working through us, but we have become accustomed to it. It is okay in our book. But is it really advancing the holy agenda of God? We need to evaluate. We need to say, God, don't let me become accustomed. Don't let me do anything because I'm accustomed. Help me to improve. Keep improving. Keep growing. Let's pray.